What a difference a week makes. The Kansas City Royals get swept by the lowly Chicago White Sox, ending some of that positive momentum that they had garnered. Is there a way for the Royals to get back on track this week? What needs to be done as we look back on that White Sox series on today's Locked On Royals podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Royals podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at Lockdown Royals. Email the show, LockdownRoyals at gmail.com. On today's show, we're going to dive into the Kansas City Royals getting beat down by the Chicago White Sox and not being able to carry any of that good momentum that we've seen them play with over the last few um, weeks at the start of May, at least. Uh, And then they got swept by Chicago in Chicago Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We'll also talk a bit about the series against Detroit and what's to come um, this week for Kansas city playing Detroit uh, to start the week. And then the nationals to book in the week and what's to come on this podcast. So thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Royals baseball, a lot to get to. We're hoping to have a a Nationals series preview with uh, Ryan Clearly of Locked On Nationals, Uh, hoping that Lindsey Crosby can join us either this week or next week uh, to discuss prospects and also the MLB draft, which is just around the corner as we see uh, college baseball heat up. And, of course, we'll have our weekly chats each week with Javier Reyes of Locked On Padres, where we talk more granular baseball things. But let's hone in on this Chicago White Sox uh, series. So that's what you everydayers can expect to happen in the future. Uh, of course, tomorrow's show, we'll, we'll, we'll talk with uh, the, the game at hand in Detroit and recap that first game of the series. But this series against Chicago, you saw on Friday, the Royals lose 2 to nothing. And it was a game where Zach Greinke pitches five and two-third, giving up five hits and two runs uh, with four strikeouts. And then out of out of the bullpen came Jackson Kowar, who shut the door, uh, gave up gave up the two walks, uh, but punched out three and gave up zero runs or zero hits uh, to to finish out the game for Kansas City and and, and get the final uh, few outs there after Zach Greinke and. When you get a performance like that from your pitching staff, when you get Zach Greinke to go out there and give you nearly six innings of two-run baseball, and then you only have to use one bullpen arm to shut the door on the rest of the game, and you finish the game with only allowing two runs, your offense has to be better. They simply have to be better. This was another game where they almost got no hit. Kopech was incredible, and he was dealing. And he was on fire, and he was everything you want him to be. Eight innings, one hit, no runs, no walks, 10 strikeouts. And I don't want to take anything away from Kopech at all because he deserves the recognition. He deserves the the flowers, the attention, the accolades from, from this performance, which was really incredible. But part of of his performance, part of his success, not all of it, but part of his success was because of the approach that the Kansas City hitters were having and the bad bad at-bats they were giving into. And then then the White Sox turned turned the ball over um, to, to Graveman in the ninth. He gets to save his third of the year. And, and the White Sox are able to win in a game where they allow one hit, no runs, and only produce five hits themselves and, and, and only get two runs across. I mean, in this game, obviously on the Royal side, no one had a multi-hit game. And, and on the White Sox side, no one had a multi-hit game either. As a matter of fact, 
only Vaughn and Sheets got on base twice in this game. This was a lackluster offensive game for each side, but when you put the performance in a vacuum, it is really disheartening to see that you finally got one of those games from your pitching staff, which has been the theme all year long. Like I think that this game kind of summarizes the season. It summarizes how you're at this point of the year, how you're, how you're at 14 and 34, uh, looking at, at being 11 and a half games out of the division, looking at being um, 14 games out of the wild card and just being absolutely buried in the standings before Memorial Day. The reason you're in this spot is there are, there are rarely, if ever, games where you have synergy, where you're both executing. Either the pitching staff is going out there and, and, and getting through the game where they only give up two runs and the hitters are just laying an egg, or you have a nice game from the hitters and they produce some runs and the pitching staff cannot limit the damage. So it is disheartening, but it was a good game from Grinky. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of the best you can hope for at this point from Grinky in his career, and then Jackson Coar, uh, he was impressive. I, I, I me personally, um, I would rather them them keep Coar in the big leagues than than sending him down. Um, I, I know that they've already sent him down, but I I disagree with that move because I think that you get more value out of him getting some innings in professional baseball in the sense of like major league baseball. Uh, versus minor league baseball, the season is over. The season is lost. Like there's, there's nothing to be won from this season, wins and losses wise. But giving him major league experience, you can just see what he is and just figure out what he can be at the at the at the MLB level. The bottom line is, if none of these guys pan out from that from that original, those original drafts where you're investing heavily on college pitching, then you need a total indefinite rebuild, tear it all down. You need to see what you're going to have left come this offseason. Because this offseason, things have to change. And, and things have to get get either um, improved upon or torn all the way down and, re- and hit the reset button with the new regime in your front office. There's no in-between. You can't just continue to kick the can down the road and, and rely on running it back with this group. So this offseason, you, you need to go all in on like I'm improving this roster with, with true, legitimate MLB-level talent. Or you need to say, look, Dayton Moore and the old regime, they didn't do a good job of drafting. They didn't do a good job of developing. We have the guys in place we believe in, but we got to get them the pieces that they believe in. So we've got to give our cooks some better ingredients, and it's going to be a full sale, tailor, tear down. It'll be four or five more years of a rebuild, but it'll be a brand new rebuild, and hopefully this time they get it right. I think that you need to do one or the other in the off season this year. And so to, part of doing that is, is getting enough data to make decisions on guys like Jackson Coar to understand what you have in your portfolio, because now you understand, Hey, Nick Prado looks to be like a really good hitter. Michael Garcia looks to be like a really good hitter and like a professional player. Vinny Pascantino, we, we know what he's brought. And then you have MJ Melendez and, and Bobby Witt Jr. who have potential out the wazoo. But he, you also need to get that data point on guys like Jackson Kowar. So I don't, I don't like that the fact that they brought him up, sent him back down um, in, in this way. Coming up, we'll talk about game two and the rest of this series against the Chicago White Sox. But first, I want to tell you right now about our good friends over at eBay Motors. eBay Motors, folks, is where you need to be because like sports, Building a championship team requires the perfect fits. That's also like working on cars. You need the perfect fit for your vehicle. You need that confidence that your vehicle is going to have the parts that you order, fit it perfectly, and that's what you get at eBay Motors. Go to eBay Motors. You can build your vision part by part at ebaymotors.com. Folks, eBay Motors is there for you or your money back guarantee. It'll be a perfect fit whenever you go and add uh, your ride to my garage and then look for the green check mark. That will be guaranteed fits or your money back guaranteed for that part. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, we'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win whenever you know the the parts will fit guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay Motors guaranteed fit. Only available in U.S. Uh, for U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. 
We're back on the Lockdown Royals podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Royals baseball. Folks, subscribe to Lockdown Royals anywhere you get your podcast from, including on YouTube. For you everydayers who listen, tomorrow's show uh, will be recapping game one of this Tigers series and seeing if the, if the Royals got back on track against Detroit. We'll also talk with Javier Reyes this week um, with our with our more – national landscape of baseball, um, including going over power rankings and and discussing the trade deadline is what I really want to focus on this week for the Royals. It looks like what they'd be selling off for the Padres and other teams. It's what kind of they'd be buying into their roster, which I think is always fun. And plus all-star, like I want to talk about all-star voting and and, and who should um, be getting more recognition for an all-star candidacy than maybe they are getting right now. So let me know who you think that is in the comments and on Twitter uh, at Lockdown Royals. And then uh, hopefully either this week or next week, early next week, we'll talk with uh, Lindsey Crosby of Lockdown Prospects about the prospect system, farm system for Kansas City. Uh, he's very busy covering Auburn baseball and prospects, so uh, we'll see if he can make some time d- during the midst of this postseason run for Auburn uh, to, to record a quick podcast talking about the farm system here in Kansas City. Now let's talk about Game 2. As you everydayers get prepared for that, Game 2, not great. Not great. Royals lose 5-1. to one. White Sox record six hits, five runs, and Lucas Giolito gets the win. Salvador Perez took him deep in the first inning, and Giolito gives up six hits across six innings, but that was the only run that came across on his watch. Uh, seven base runners total for Giolito with the uh, walk and, and the one walk and the six hits. Four strikeouts and did give up that home run to Salvador Perez. Um, Crochet came in, got the uh, one out, uh, but he also, in his time, gave up a hit in a walk. So they brought in uh, Lopez, who got the last two outs of the seventh. And then Joe Kelly pitched a great eighth inning. Uh, Graveman pitched in the ninth, and it was able to be a victory for the White Sox in this one. Uh, the Royals side of things, Jordan Lyles, five innings of five-run baseball. Only four of them were earned. Uh, he got touched up a bit for four hits and three walks, but had five strikeouts. Uh, Koss came in with an inning and only up one hit. Uh, Josh Taylor, an inning, only gave up one hit. Josh Stalmont came in, pitched well. So if you could have reduced some of that damage from Jordan Lyles, this game does not look nearly as bad because the bullpen was actually really good. I thought that Josh Stalmont's stuff looked looked really impressive, and he's looked good this season. Uh, I thought that Koss gave you – He's he's kind of been like a interesting pitcher to me as a guy who some nights he's out there and he's a little wild. He's a little he's he's a little like if you only watched him once and you watched him on a bad night, you'd think, "Eesh, how is he? How is he in the major leagues?" But then other nights you watch him and he has that kind of funky delivery and he and he and he has uh, some of st- some of the some of the good stuff. Uh, and movement that you think, okay, this guy can actually be something in the bullpen. So he he's kind of a hit or miss reliever, and this time he hit. I mean, this game against Chicago. Ultimately, again, the offense was just not up to par. Besides Salvador Perez, Salvador Perez was awesome. Uh, he, he had the home run off Gilito, uh way back in the first inning. Talked a little, uh, talked a little trash coming around the bases too. Uh, I, I think it was all in good fun, but you know, kind of chirping at the uh, White Sox dugout. Uh, a little bit. He had three hits total with, of course, the the home run producing an RBI and a run scored for him. So we went three for four in this game. Uh, Bobby Witt Jr. went one for four with a strikeout. Uh, Nick Prado had a double. I, I really enjoy what Nick Prado is bringing to the table this year. Um, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how you flush out this lineup. I, I think that the pathway to, to this, like whenever – if you want to like envision what the future looks like when this team is like really good and when this team is like playing games that matter, like when this team is putting out a lineup where they're trying to win at all costs, they would put, I think, Salvi at catcher, Nick Prado at first, Vinny P at DH, and then you'd have the outfield, uh, MJ Melendez and right. Uh, and then you, and then you kind of would fill out like Nate Eaton in center. That's fine. Edward Levieris and right. I mean, in le- uh, left, that's fine. Or you know, hopefully Drew Waters or somebody gets gets promoted after after recovering from injury, and they're the ones filling those slots. But like, and as far as those puzzle pieces, I don't think that Prado would be in the outfield 
in a game where you had to win. I think that he'd be more so the first baseman. I think he's a little bit better of a first baseman than Vinny P. So you move Vinny P to DH and you have Salvador Perez um, catch. Uh, but obviously in this game, Vinny P was at first base because Nick Prado was in the outfield and Salvador Perez uh, needed a day to DH instead of uh, instead of catch. And in this season, there's no point in not doing this, right? Because it gets Nick Prado reps in the outfield, which is fine. I don't think it'll ever be like a really above average outfielder. I hope that he can get to an average level outfielder um, in general, even. But in this specific season, there's no point to to task Salvi with overloading his catching duties for a season that's a lost cause record wise. Uh, and it's a it's a kind of a double edged sword where you are getting Prado and other guys' experience um, in other areas. So I actually do like the philosophy of doing that this specific season. But I think that long term, the vision would be Prado to be your first baseman. Vinny P to be your DH, Salvi to be your cent, uh, you, you know your, your your catcher, um, and you and you work around from there. Uh, I really like Michael Garcia. I, I know that he went over four and he had three strikeouts, but I, I just like the way that he battles, um, especially uh, not just in this series, but like throughout the time he's been in the bigs um, so far in his career. But Nick Prado has been the star of the show. He's hitting two twenty and uh, two twenty nine and a nine ten OPS. So far, and he's just he's just been really good and, and had the double uh, and the little peace sign celebration that took the Royals into game three on Sunday. Uh, the game three was interesting because coming into it on Sunday afternoon, you had the White Sox who have been horrendous and arguably in a worse spot than Kansas City because I think that if you told Kansas City fans back in you know March or back in February that they'd sit at Memorial Day at 14 and 34. No one would be happy. People would would project, oh, they'll be a little better than that. But no one would be absolutely stunned, jaw dropped if you said I'm from the future and this is what actually happened. Um again, I said preseasons they'd be more competitive and that they would be a team that is in it in, in each game and is fun to watch. That has not been the case so far this year. I was wrong about that. But but again, if you would have told me I'm from the future and I know exactly what happened when they started out 14-34, I'd go, yeesh, all right, it's kind of believable. For the White Sox, if you have told me that, I would have been dumbfounded that the White Sox would be 10 games below 500. And so I said it to say this. So like their fans and their organization has been spiraling, um, whereas the Royals fans are a little bit apathetic and like are a little bit like, okay, well, what's the next step for the franchise moving forward? Uh, the White Sox fans, of course, are in a terrible spot. And so I think that coming into Sunday, I say all this to say this. Coming into Sunday, all the pressure was on Chicago of like, look, you've gotten the series win. You desperately need to get a series sweep at home, kind of kind of boost everyone up, um, um, you know, boost, boost the confidence of the team, of the fan base, um, and just get some momentum rolling in baseball, which is an everyday sport. So I do believe in momentum more than other sports, especially. Um, whereas Kansas City, you just go into it going, ah, hopefully we don't get swept. And so the the mental edge favored Chicago, I think, and the pressure was all on Chicago, and they were able to make uh, diamonds out of that pressure. We'll talk about how the White Sox are able to do that in Game 3 coming up, but first, I want to see right now about our good friends over at So Rare. Folks, So Rare is awesome. It is our new sponsor, So Rare. Uh, it is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game in a marketplace transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital trading cards. Um, featuring players from across all 30 teams. Uh, so make sure you check it out today because SoRare has game weeks that happen twice weekly over the span of three to four cycles. At the end of the game week, SoRare uh, will rank their managers. At, uh, if you rank near the top of the leaderboards, you will win a variety of rewards. Uh, that includes SoRare security cards, um, game tickets, merchandise, signed jerseys, VIP experiences such as meeting MLB stars, uh, prizes that may vary depending on competition, so check it out today. Head on over to SoRare.com slash locked on. That's so rare, S-O-R-A-R-E.com to draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and compare um, your team and start competing today uh, to win epic rewards. Again, that's SoRare.com slash locked on to start playing today. SoRare.com slash locked on. SoRare.com slash locked on. We're back on the Lockdown Royals podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder 
Royals basketball. Well, we're talking Royals baseball here on game number three of the White Sox and Royals series. Game three, mentioned it before the break, all of the focus, pressure, whatever you want to call it, was on Chicago, and they came through. Uh, five runs on nine hits. The Royals got on top early, two to nothing, and, and held that lead all the way until the bottom of the fifth inning whenever Chicago struck for three runs. Then they tacked on another one in the seventh after getting one in the fourth. The Royals lineup was highlighted by uh, Michael Massey's home run, which I believe came the day after he got engaged. So congratulations to uh, Massey. I believe he's in his hometown and uh, having a lot of fun against his hometown team. Uh, had two RBIs in this one. So he, he produced both runs for Kansas City on that two-run shot. Um, and, and the Royals, in general, were over two with runners in scoring position with five left on base. Uh, but other than Massey's home run, I mean, Edward, Edward Olivieras got a base knock, which set up, you know, set the table for Massey's home run. Salvador Perez got a hit. Matt Duffy continues to impress. And I, I wonder what Matt Duffy's value would be on the trade market, which is one I'm going to talk about with Javi Reyes. But like, other than the home run for Mike Massey, this was a devastating game for the Royals offense. They just got carved up by Lance Lynn, uh, who made the one mistake pitch and only gave up four uh, four hits. And then you and then you get to the bullpen, and once again, this White Sox bullpen, Middleton, no hits allowed, one walk. Bummer, no hits, no walks, two strikeouts. Joe Kelly, no hits, uh, no walks, two strikeouts, no runs allowed either, um, obviously. Just a terrible offensive weekend for Kansas City. And it's been frustrating because it does it there just doesn't seem like a rhyme or reason to like why they started out so slow, why at the start of May they look so good, and why now at the end of May they don't look good at all. The ebbs and flows of this aren't adding up. And so I I, I hope that I hope that you're able to see this offense come together a bit. Because I because I think that if you just did the blind name test. And you just sat back and went, Bobby Witt Jr., Nick Prado, Salvador Perez, Michael Garcia, Vinny P, MJ Melendez. Like if you if you did that, you'd say, yeah, you know, those are those are competitive hitters. Those are those are good hitters, but they're not performing yet. And I just don't know why or what they need to do to adjust or uh, anything of that nature. Uh, Carlos Hernandez was an opener for two innings, three strikeouts. Uh, they went to uh, Castellano for four and two thirds and he just unraveled. And that was the, that was the ball game. Like, like Carlos Hernandez looked good as an opener, but your piggyback guy was terrible. Uh, eight hits, five runs, one strikeout, gave up a home run. Uh, Clark cleaned it up and ended the fifth inning. And then, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, ended the, uh, ended the uh, seventh inning. Uh, Amir Garrett pitched in the eighth, only gave up one hit, one walk and one strikeout to get out of it clean without giving up, a, giving up a, uh, run so Garrett came in and didn't go up a run but it was just one guy it was one guy that kind of uh, ended the game so to say um for for the Royals in this one and the, and the offense of course is not without blame because you just aren't going to win many games in 2023 only scoring two runs and and it was a two runs that was it, it's not that it's fluky but like it wasn't as though you had a ton of guys on base and just couldn't capitalize with situational hitting. You didn't get anyone on, ba- anyone on base, and you could got a two-run shot from a hometown kid uh, in the top of the second and just were quiet and didn't threaten after that. So uh, I, I think that that's kind of where the Royals stand. And now look, they got to try to turn it back around. Like they're playing some good baseball to start of May. Now you 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 come back home in Kansas City, to Kansas City, you host the Tigers, and you're going to face off with Lorenzen on uh, Monday, and it'll be Singer versus Lorenzen. Brady Singer has to come out here and play and pitch well against the Tigers and really try to stop the bleeding and try to get the ball rolling. Like, that's the pressure that you have as an ace. Uh, I get it. And, like, as a as a guy like Brady Singer, as a guy like Zach Grinke, you have the pressure of, like, trying to stop the, the cold spell, but someone's got to do it, and let, let's see what he can do at home. We'll be back tomorrow to recap that game. Until then, be good and be good to one another.